Three, two, one. Hey there folks, I'm Mark, in affiliation with Spectrum Pulse, and it's the Gunna Album Bomb episode, and this, it's Billboard Breakdown. So, my childhood was musical, I will say that. Um, I was into singing at a very early age. Um, I took piano lessons starting probably when I was, I want to say, eight or nine, and that continued till I was like 16, 17. Um, so I got up to like, I want to say grade six in terms of key, in terms of piano theory, like grade two, I think, just mm -hmm. in Royal Conservatory stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't think I have a tremendous amount of playing talent, in my opinion, which I think is fair. Just hand-eye coordination has never been my thing. Um, but singing and that sort of thing was always a thing in the house, like my my parents were in my parents like music they were never super nerdy about it but mm -hmm. there was music in the house they liked creating that vibe we got used to singing as a family that was something that was very common for us and it's different but it was a lot of fun my mom was huge into soft rock classic rock that sort of thing like 70s and 80s 70s and 80s a little bit more alternative my dad was always very into r&b and disco and soul music a um, bit of a different split there. And I inherited all of their vinyl. <laughs> and what's interesting there is that around that same time, like late 80s, early 90s, they started getting into country music. And that's what they, they had, my mom especially had heard a lot of country growing up, but now it was more pronounced. And that was a good time to get into country. Country was really good in the 90s. So that um, karaoke was a split. There was a lot of country that came up there. Um, I was into the boy band stuff around that time too. So there was that stuff. And then it was just a lot of pop that came out in like the 60s and 70s and like a, a lot of hits, not a lot of deep dives, not a lot of stuff that's in the dial. It, it was pretty, a lot of it was closer to the easy listening side. There wasn't a lot of heavy stuff. Um, parents were also a little wary when it came to like, when I asked them for an Eminem album, it was the sort of thing they were like, well, you get the censored version of an Eminem album. The funny thing is that the censored version of the Marshall Mathers LP still has a lot of swearing and like really like risque content at the time. So they cut the most contentious song and they replace it with an extended South Park skit. As <laughs> if South Park is better. I also think my sister is a great singer, but she doesn't like to sing the same way I do. So I was more into stuff that was a little bit like as I got older, I was into I was into stuff that was starting to range wider. I got into metal. She absolutely did not. She l listened to more easy listening stuff, a little bit more like pop country. I'd say her taste, her her musical taste is more reserved. Um, I remember one time in like 2014, and she, we were I think she and I were she came out to visit me, and she's like, Mark, I got this new indie pop band that I, I, you probably really like them. They're called the 1975. I'm like, oh dear. Um, because not only was I familiar with them, I'd already reviewed them a year earlier. And this time we're gonna be talking about the self-titled debut album from the band, the 1975. Yeah, um, from like, I was like four to 18, that was all Winnipeg. One thing I will say in terms of musical stuff is that there is musicianship on both sides of my family and people who are into it, but in different ways. Mm -hmm. Like my uncle's very into, was very left of the dial, like who talking heads in the seventies, like a bit of punk, uh, like pavement, like a lot of like the all an alternative era. And then my cousins on that side of the family were very into classic rock, like a lot of blues rock, a lot of Zeppelin, a lot of Beatles, that sort of thing as well. My mom's side, there's actually one of, there's one cousin of mine who is a professional jazz bassist. I did choir oh, stuff um, okay. all the way through. What else? There was, there was also a couple of other performance stuff pieces. Um, I, it's kind of funny. I remember that our gym teacher, who, who is this very, 
when looking back on it, he had a very drill sergeant style and attitude because he came mm-hmm. up from the States and he had that vibe to him. Mm-hmm. But it was kind of funny because he won- he ran a dance unit every year for those of us in gym, like up to like grade 10 when we had to take gym. I remember getting help with my from my little sister because my little sister danced for years, like ballet, jazz, tap, break dancing, river dance, like a whole a whole spiel. Wow. I remember she helped me choreograph a dance for um, for the dance unit. I wound up getting the highest grade out of that unit in dance in like like grade ten, and it was something that my gym teacher remembered in the point that he now t- that he was teaching it to later years. Awesome. And I'm like, that was something my sister did, not me. That's and I always do work out to music. Like right. the runner's high is real. Uh, endorphin rushes are absolutely real. And you hit the right song at the right point. You can just go forever. Fine. There was a file server that we all had in residence that we would basically, everyone would dump their music collections on there okay. and everyone would download and share from each other. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I got 40 gigs of trance music just off of that. So so like there was points where I would go to raves. There was metal heads that I I hung out with that I got into progressive metal and like various offshoots of that. Got lots of classic rock exposure. There was lots of, and there were some performance events around there. It was related to Waterloo. It was like our residence that we were in. I majored in physics and I minored in economics. Now, the interesting thing I always say is that physics at some point really translates well into a music conversation because you have to learn electrics. Um, you have to learn there is some levels of engineering. There's lots of waveform analysis. A lot of it, so a lot of the language and communication of that really translates well into music. And this is like, that's the weird thing because when you start looking at early YouTube, a lot of it is there for people who wanted to start making like short films or like smallish little video essays or little pieces that would that would fit well on a platform that was for like the first vlogs was there um i was aware of people who did online video i thought it was cool um there was a lot of critics around that time like 2009 2010 um like the whole channel awesome scene a lot of like the um, loading ready run was a Canadian comedy sketch troupe that I followed. And there was a big thing, whether they move in over to YouTube only when YouTube got high definition video. Um, I watched a lot of the stuff on the escapist, which was an offshoot video game site. So again, I was aware of sites that were adjacent to YouTube before YouTube became a mono platform. So, which was interesting because you saw a lot of these sites that were competing with YouTube, but it had to get around YouTube's, content id nonsense because and that became such a huge bulwark for a lot of critics around that time so that kind of kept i'm like it's cool i can see myself wanting to do this and i can see how my critical style would have been shaped by people who were in those spaces but at the same time i'm like it was gonna be a lot of work for me to do any of that and i i I had no dick about like filming so (laughs) Yeah, I would check up on things like I would follow certain creators if they were on YouTube. But that's the thing. Most of the ones I watched were not on YouTube. Okay. I only started really watching YouTube larger, I'd say around 2011, 2012, like closer after I left university. I think I wrote like three quarters of a million words of fanfic. Like, so lots of stuff there. Then from there, I also was play. I also played D and D a lot, and that also translates to a very you you learn how to build dramatic storytelling very strongly through that medium. I in 2012, I wrote the first draft of my book, and that book came out. Eventually, I sold to a publisher in 2014, and it, came, it got published in 2015. It's called To Kill a Dragon. So it very it was on a small indie press. It did okay. Publisher went out of business three years later. So mm-hmm. I'm not saying it was on me, but I think it was just a small publisher and they're just like, it was hard to, it's hard to stay afloat in the publishing market in today's day and age. That was also one of the reasons I actually went YouTube and predominantly stayed independent rather than go to any of the big publications or try to chase that side of things. Because I'll give you a bit of an example. Back in, I first started YouTube, I had gotten a camera going and I was doing stuff specifically around country. Um, I got reached out by Rolling Stone Country, and they're wondering, do you want to be on our writing staff? And I told, I said them, I told them no, because a, I value my editorial independence, and I wasn't going to get that over there. And the other side of things is very much like I was doing okay in my own little space. Like this was, 
for me initially it was a hobby it then later translated into a second job <laughs> Right. Depends what I'm doing. Um, Billboard breakdown. I have such a I have such a structure to it, right. it because again it's very serialized. I know which piece I'm chunking out bit by bit. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of albums. It depends on the album, but a, for the majority of albums, I normally write my preamble first, mm -hmm. um, then listen to the album four or five times, and then build off of the preamble, or sometimes junk it and throw it out to try something new altogether. Um, Sometimes I write very minimal scripts uh, if I'm just going to riff on something very off the cuff, which is rare, but sometimes I'm doing it to make a point, such as every time I talk about Kanye West. And, <laughs> and all right, let's talk about the newest album from Kanye West. Yay. There wasn't real, there were creators I admired. There were people like um, Louis Lovog. He's a comic book reviewer that I, is still <laughs> active today. Um, Todd in the Shadows, who did a lot of like pop song review structures. Um, I had watched a bunch of those guys do the video form, and I was doing the blogging stuff. And the blogging stuff was moving, but mm -hmm. it wasn't getting tons of traffic because like I had SEO optimized very well. I'm like, YouTube is a platform I can utilize to get additional audiences in. And I'm like, let's give it a shot. The one thing I will always say about doing YouTube music reviews is you're never going to go viral off of them. Like, mm -hmm. And to be honest, I think the, the perception that certain critics have such a huge leg up, like Anthony Fantano with his two plus million subscribers, the one big thing to highlight there is that he got, he got that boost, he got an initial boost very early on by YouTube using the On The Rise program. And On, on The Rise got discontinued, I want to say, within the first, by the time I had joined YouTube, it was nearly done. It was very much they give somebody a profile, they give somebody a little bit of a platform, they get that additional 30, 40,000 subscriber boost out of the gate, and then they let the algorithm play from there. And he's one of the very few who has sustained and only built relevance since. I once saw, I'm going to cite Shane Dawson here, and I regret doing it already. Um, the comment Shane Dawson said, and it was actually kind of canny when it came to YouTubers, was very much of the majority of them are there and gone within five years. They will get to a point, they will crest, they'll peak, they'll crash out, they're gone. I think, and he's right about that. I honestly think it's probably a little shorter. I'd probably say it's within two to three years these days. Mm -hmm. The fact that I'm still doing this over 10 years in and my biz and the business is stable mm -hmm. is kind of a testament to the fact that for me, I approached it very much in terms of ways of let's try to build this systemically and sustainably. Mm -hmm. I wasn't going to be chasing virality. I realized very quickly I didn't do reaction content. That didn't really fit for me. A lot of my reviews were very formalized. They were structured. They I, they were very heavily scripted, as you saw. Like, mm. And I wanted to ensure that what I was saying would translated most effectively. Um, earliest highlights, I'd say, were... Well, I learned a lot. For one thing, I will say, you learn a lot very quickly that if you have a bad camera, there will be tons of people who click away. Like I, when I finally got my camera and I finally got something after my first 40 or so videos, like you click away, you, you, like you, you, you try to build more of an audience that they'll stay for the visuals as well. I think there is a lot of people who will be very visually entertained quickly rather than default to something that is more dense in terms of content, which is one reason I don't think I have ever built something that is built for easy crossover or easy virality because a lot of my stuff gets dense pretty quickly because there's a lot of angles that I'm naturally considering that a bunch of people may not be. The tricky thing that comes with that is you gotta be prepared to, A, you gotta be prepared to get, face the wrath of fandoms that are not used to getting talked about. And I was not someone who compromised my opinion either. So I didn't really care who I pissed off. <laughs> so... I, you like you can't see them now because they got rid of the dislike bar but there was a time I would get pretty hefty chunks of dislikes from pretty much every fan base even if I was positive on some cases because I wasn't positive enough and the point for this is that I'm like I eventually I realized I didn't care like mm -hmm. it was the sort of thing I'm like okay you roll with the punches like a bunch of people online don't like what I have to say so I don't like I don't like half the shit they have to say either like you stop reading the comments very early because otherwise it'll do, it'll do havoc to your mental health. 
it's not even the hate. You see so much positivity from, if you're building a fan base, you'll see a lot of positivity, but it'll be the one negative comment that pisses you off and you find yourself seeking that out. That's not good. That's not good at all. So, well, it's harder to ignore the one because it stands out. Right. And especially on videos that like, if you, and that's the other thing, you cannot predict which of your videos are going to take off versus which will not. You th might think you have an idea of it, but you don't. Like if you're talking on a major popular subject or major popular artist, maybe it ain't guaranteed though. <laughs> Especially if you like, if you're algorithmically, if your video is not hit the algorithm at the right time, or if it doesn't show up in search results the way you want it to, it's dicey. Mm -hmm. Billboard breakdown is its own thing entirely because billboard breakdown I've realized has an audience that is not just mine. It, it also is the chart watcher types. So I'm really, they, they aren't always there for me as the critic. They're there because I'm the only person on that has consistently talked about Billboard and the Hot 100 for years now. It's going mm -hmm. up on, again, like it, this is, I'm in my ninth year of doing it. Mm -hmm. It's been, in my opinion, a successful series. It led to a lot of growth of my channel. I, I'm still divided on whether or not I should have split it from my main channel. I did it ultimately to help copyright nonsense. At the same time, you'll see people who are going there and they'll have conversations because they found a community. I don't foster it. I step in if things get a little bit too radically out of hand and sometimes it absolutely does. Mm -hmm. um, last video strings to mind because uh, Jason Aldean. Yeah. So I sometimes I keep an eye on it there, but I've never shut off the comments. Mm -hmm. I don't believe in doing that because again, I don't really engage with them. Like there is like the billboard breakdown comments kind of a kind of a life of their own. I'm like, I'm going to leave you over there. I'm going to have you all be happy. I will put a pinned comment if I fuck up something in the video and my discord will tell me as soon as that happens. So I'm normally well aware of it. Um, and then very much you just let it go. The learning to make your own, it's a mixed bag, whether thumbnails work or not. Um, I have made thumbnails consistently since 2017. I realized that was something that I should try to do. It kind of works because it, it appears more professional. Same time, half the videos that are some of the biggest on my channel have no thumbnail whatsoever and they work just fine. So it's one of those weird situations where sometimes it'll buoy traction, sometimes nobody cares. I do it specifically for me because these days I like a more curated presentation. Half the stuff I do on my channel, I'm fairly certain I'm the only one who cares that I'm doing it. Like I post all of my scripts on my, on my website mm -hmm. where I have, I have scripted all my videos and I post those scripts later. Specifically because I know there's going to be some people who will want to read my reviews. Mm -hmm. And I've also seen way too many music writers and bloggers have their sites go, have sites that they've written on go down and they lose their back catalog. They lose their archives. There's tons of dead links. Whereas I have all of mine going back to 2012. Mm -hmm. I have over 10 years of written work that I can refer to. And that's tremendously powerful in and of itself. That's one reason when I got my website built, I was such a, I was a pain in the ass for that website designer to ensure that it was indexed properly, that it was well searchable, that people could actually go in. It wasn't just there to look pretty. What other aha moments? Um, if you're going to make, the one that stands out to me, and this is something that I actually worked with a colleague that came out. There's a bit of a funny story with this one. Mm -hmm. There was a rap album, an underground rap album uh, by a rapper Cage. Um, he was big in the 2000s, the underground horror core scene. He, he had a comeback album, came out in 2013. I did not care for it at all. I was actually a fan of the guy. And then he's kind of like, uh, he sounds really flat. He sounds really dull. I got another creator showed up in my comments and he's like, you're wrong. You didn't get it. Here's why. The funny thing with that, it's very easy to start fights. It's very difficult to step back and say, okay, maybe I missed something. Maybe mm -hmm. I got it wrong. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's worthwhile actually trying to take the broader consideration because you two will expose you to audiences all over the damn world that will show you context that you might not know, or mm -hmm. there, you can't assume you know everything. So in that particular case, I later reached out to the guy and he and I talked it out. We, I actually did a re-review of the album just with him. Then he and I shot another review. Then we met each other in person in 2017. <laughs> 
like it's a lot of it's fostering communities and the thing is while you do get a lot of people who are very drama focused in youtube or doing everything for the brand um and we'll get to that in a second because there's actually something about youtube spaces in terms of how you try to foster that in-person collaboration that i will get to the one thing i find very funny is that a lot of these people are primarily especially in music predominantly introverted they're there just to have a good to talk have a good time talk about things they enjoy they found community and right. they want to share it um the one key thing i will say is that you will be nitpicked to hell and back regardless of whether or not you're right or wrong for mm -hmm. me my big thing i don't speak spanish at all so the rise of reggaeton the rise of the regional mexican sound I have discovered a whole language I have very little familiarity with. <laughs> it's a running you know. joke how bad my pronunciation is going to be. But that's the thing. Being able to look outside yourself and realize, okay, this person doesn't live everywhere at once. That's something that I as a creator have to think about. Your average commenter does not. Which is, which is interesting because I always feel like that's one of those elements that should be obvious on a global platform. But it's rarely often seen that way. So you are now having to, you're, you're having to deal with a different societal constraint that's rarely considered hmm. like we're it's a much more globalized atmosphere okay, this was something youtube tried and you know what i'll give them credit they did they set up one in toronto literally 15 minute walk where before where i used to live okay. they wanted to get youtube creators to come in and actually use the space and set it like they had sets built they had cameras set up they had everything like that built and ready to go like the sports YouTubers, a lot of them parlayed from comedy or scripted content into more of sports coverage. And they did so really well. And they found an opportunity to collaborate in that environment. That's a lot more rare, I think, in some music spaces. And it kind of shouldn't be. That's a weird thing. You'd think it being a more artistic space, there'd be more room for it. The second point I want to bring up is the uh, corporate channels. Um, corporate channels are a bit of a mixed bag. Because you have the ones that YouTube backs and the ones that YouTube doesn't. The one that YouTube, the ones that YouTube backs are like the big like late night comedians or like news channels, stuff like that. They get backing, they get promotion. Fine. I'm not gonna be even competing in that space anyway. When I went to one of those YouTube spaces, um, the there was a representative from Indie 88, mm -hmm. which was a Toronto indie rock based music station. And they do a bunch of like internal YouTube videos, stuff like that. And I'm like, oh, this is cool. Let's talk about music stuff. And it was very obvious from then that the old guard of radio and that structure does not get YouTube, does not care to get YouTube, and will look down on any creator that comes out of YouTube. Because from then it is very much, we have our structure, we have our silo, we have our space in terms of how music is supposed to be made, promoted, circulated, you are not a part of that. I think the difference that comes out of that, especially when it comes with radio, is very much that radio, you have to pay your dues. There's very much a dues paying structure. There's a hierarchy. There's a way this has worked for years in this structure. We have It fosters a lot of relationships. Mm -hmm. Whereas those of us, especially in YouTube, we have a little bit more free reign. We can do things our own way. We can pivot in our own way. We can say things about acts and not have to worry about jeopardizing a relationship, which is a big thing that like, I think a lot of music critics, especially music critics who are on like a YouTube platform, that's where there was some initial tension between writers who worked at Pitchfork or Rolling Stone or Uproxx or those places like that, which is why I actually have to give a lot of credit to Uproxx for being willing to accept YouTube ballots for their aggregated music critic top tens that they put out. So I actually reached out to them um, in 2018, 2019, I'm not sure. I'm like, hey, I'm a music critic. I've written thousands of reviews by that point mm -hmm. and I have a catalog. Um, will you give, well, I get a ballot and they actually let me have one. I've been contributing to that for the past four or five years. And there's other YouTubers now who contribute as well. I think the fact that the writers have embraced more of that side and are willing to take a slightly more adversarial relationship to things has given them a little bit more flexibility than the industry types, especially when you like, and this also translates to festivals or 
like they'll see YouTubers come to the festivals. They're like, oh, you're just influencers here for the free tickets and the perks rather than people who actually do the work. I think that is a shame because I, a lot of the YouTubers in this space, we work our, we work our fucking asses off. The amount of privilege that I think some radio people have and like, oh, we get the interviews first because we are radio. I'm like, yeah, but you're not going to ask them anything interesting. You don't have Charlemagne who's going to who's going to say something that's going to be contentious. You don't have an Ebro who's going to push back. And that's hip hop space predominantly. I've seen this in rock spaces, and they're some of the dullest interviews imaginable. Whereas a YouTuber is at least going to try to present something interesting. Like I'll give you here's a fun example. There was one there. I don't know if the channel's still active, but it was basically it was a six or seven year old girl who used to interview rock stars. And it was so sweet because she would actually ask pretty smart questions. Like it is clear that she had a passion for music and she was very, she was very, very smart, probably coached by her parents a little bit. And I saw that and the musicians were really game for it because it's like, it's something new. Because I think a lot of radio has gotten used to not having to do the additional work. They have gotten used to not asking the follow-up question or digging deeper. It's mm-hmm. one reason I, I do not do interviews very often. I've done two. Back when I did my series called Resonators, which was, oh, I have, I, I wish that series took off. I really did. I did 24 episodes of it. Um, basically, it was my desire to go back to eras of sound and learn a subgenre. Like in 2018, it was hardcore punk. In 2019, it was underground rap. And I got interviews to cap off both of my last two videos, both of my last videos in per year. I got good interviews. I got good content. But I also got it in a way that I was asking tougher questions than you can clearly tell that they were used to. That was entirely off the cuff. Okay. I've known John since twenty eighteen, since twenty fourteen. For this one, I don't feel like doing it alone. Haven't done one of these in a little while, so all right, take two of this, and here we are with a special guest that we have not had on in about three and a half years. I think since the Kesha High Road review. It's John from ARTV. How are you feeling, John? Hey, I'm hanging in there, Mark. Thanks for having me on. We've collaborated a number of times. We've met each other in person three or four times. Like, we've been friends forever. Um, And that we have some level of chemistry that immediately can come out of that. He's got a different style and focus for his content than I do. He's considerably more accessible with how he frames his content. That's one thing I will always salute him. He does a really good job with that. Mm -hmm. I think he and I have had tension in the past because there's like, I wish he would go deeper on certain stuff. I wish that there's, he gives certain artists a pass. I do not. Like he's a much more separate the art from the artist thing. And I'm like, he can't really do that in a performative medium, different conversation. (laughs) He and I, and two other music, two other music creators, um, Luke Spencer, um, he, uh, he runs the Rocked channel. And then another creator, Crash Thompson. The four of us back since 2018, we've done something called Rock Coliseum, where basically we get requests from the chat where the chat gives us, a na- gives us an artist and we give them thumbs up, thumbs down. We have to explain why. And then those that get the most thumbs down get to be punished in the Coliseum. We've been doing this since 2018. We've got about 15 to 16 episodes. Mm -hmm. Uh, They each run for like two hours long. Um, Mm -hmm. I I feel a little strange that somebody's actually documented everything that we've said within those, which is a little weird to us because again, it's so much content. Um, It was a big thing for us during the pandemic, especially because we're all in lockdown. We had something that we could share with each other. But again, when you have a bunch of us, we've all met in person. We've all got good, we've got good chemistry with each other. Mm -hmm. That matters. For John and I, I think we try to find common ground, but we also try to find the places where we go against each other and push off a little bit because he and I are both, we're, we're, we're both been honed in all the conflict that we faced online. We've <laughs> seen all of it. We, and sometimes to some degree, you have to be willing to punch back as hard as you take it. Like <laughs> I've been in the scene for 10 years. I right. picked up on so many little things. I've seen artists come and go. You, li- I listen to a lot of podcasts and blogs, and I read a lot of the business sections in terms of how this all works. Mm-hmm. I've had to read more court filings than I ever want to. Um, sometimes you get familiar with how a scene is constructed, and especially when you do historical research, uh, and you start putting things together in hindsight. Like the video essay I'm working on right now is about bro country. 
that whole scene from like 2011 to 2013, 2014 in country music. It was very guys of all about the trucks and girls and the beer and all that sort of thing. A lot of the predecessor to what made Morgan Wallen the thing right now. Jason Aldean is from that scene and he's been around since then. Luke Combs came up in that scene. Mm -hmm. So I think you kind of have to understand the past to triangulate now. And so building that level of historical context, it takes a long ass time, but a lot of it is just building expertise. And even then, I will confess there's huge chunks of this, which for me is speculation, supposition, things that I observe in details, but might not be on the mark. This doesn't feel real. I know when the industry is putting up, is selling something. Mm -hmm. Like one of the worst things I had to learn about in talking about music promotion and publication, some of the nasty stuff you see in the music industry is something called the mental health rollout. For some reason, labels send me promo packages that I don't read at all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I get lots of them. Um, and the key thing is that you start seeing it framed as you can't just talk about the music. There's got to be a story behind the artist as well. Mm -hmm. And especially, and the one thing that they try to draw upon is that the artist is struggling with their mental health. There's been a lot more focus and introspection about that. And the labels have thought, are like, okay, how can we commodify this? How can we frame this and sell a relatable story? And furthermore, use that as a deflection from anyone who's going to critique it because they're like, well, you can't say anything bad about that. He's going through a real, he or she's going through a real mental health issue at the time. And I'm like, this is gross. Even if it's true, even if, even if in cases where it's entirely valid, it's kind of gross to see it in a commodified conversation. It was, again, when Kanye West was going around saying he was bipolar and that was the run up to his album in 2018. And I'm like, you know what? Even if it's all true, does it excuse someone for what they say and do? Does it excuse the handlers around him who have clearly failed at their jobs? Mm -hmm. Does it excuse how that is commodified? No, that's the key thing. When you start becoming aware of the tactics you, it's it's something that becomes a factor in how you see the systems that surround the world. You see systems of how the music industry works. And even if I don't have all of the answers or I get answers that are kind of piecemeal here or there, I just accumulate a lot of them. And that's the benefit of having an archive is that I can search up any of it at any given notice. And what I, what I said back then on previous albums and what I'm saying now, all the time, I, it's easy for me to search my own stuff. And I'm like, for instance, I'm working on a review of the new Carly Rae Jepsen album. It's still good. It's still worth hearing. But I don't know. She's capable of greatness. Which I like, don't love. I want to like it a lot more. And I've got thoughts as to why. Um, the interesting thing there is that I have Carly Rae Jepsen reviews going back to 2015. So I have one, two, three, four. I got five reviews I can pull on. It's not recycling myself because the albums are different. But trying to build a continuity or how you have thought about someone over a period of time, it helps. And then the other thing I want to highlight here is that in terms of communities, I would say I'm not an active participant in a lot of communities, but I'm often a fly on the wall. Like I will observe what's being said in hip hop Twitter or what's being said around country music blogs or I'll watch a bunch of metal forums, or I'll get in the weeds. There's a big one for the Hot 100s called the Pulse Music Forums, where mm -hmm. I where they will actually provide a lot of the hardline analytical data in terms of how these charts are being compiled. They have ideas about how the formula was structured, and I just keep an eye on it, a little mm -hmm. bit from a distance. But but I can always and I can tell when people know that I'm watching because sometimes mm -hmm. I'll show up and they're like, "Oh shit, it's Mark." <laughs> it's hurt me overall. I will say that. Um, the people who can folk, who can micro focus and micro target, um, especially if they can find one genre and just focus all of their content on that, they tend to do really well. Um, especially if they just focus everything on hip hop, they do well. I don't do that. I'm one of one of the few critics left who try to cover everything. I didn't want to feel pigeonholed. Um, mm -hmm. I wanted to be able to talk. I wanted to feel like I could speak coherently on everything. Or like if there was going to be things that are coming or changing, I wanted to have an idea of what it was or so I didn't get caught by surprise, which is both good and bad. Like on the one hand, I do kind of miss getting caught by surprise or I wish there were points where I was less not surprised. 
Well, the album reviews are pulled from my Patreon. I get pulled from my patrons who like give me albums to cover. I will often go off script if I find something that I want to cover because I, I have a routine every day. I go on Bandcamp and I get my Bandcamp recommendations. I listen to all, I listen to songs from all of them. Um, like there's those days. Sometimes I'll hear buzz around something from another website or other critics are talking about something. I'm like, okay, that's interesting. We'll check how big their backlog is. I'm like, okay, I can do that. I'll I'll throw it on my schedule. And sometimes I'll just preempt everything. I'm like, screw it. I'm talking about this because I have enough to say. Like there's times I've I do that at least four or five times a year. <laughs> the problem is, and it's a big thing, talking about music. You're gonna, you're talking to an audience who doesn't know this, who doesn't know technicalities, who doesn't know how chords are supposed to resolve, who don't who doesn't understand the concept of something being in one key versus another. They don't understand tempo. They don't understand a lot of that stuff. So you have to be able to, as a, as a music writer and creator, you have to be able to talk about all of that stuff without getting too subsumed in jargon. If I'm going to say, like, I can explain why something works on a technical level for me, but you'll get more of a response from the audience if it's like, you can have the technical details as garnish to talking about something that is more personal and emotive, something that they can connect to and relate to. If you can't explain what you're talking about um, in language people understand, you failed as a writer. That's my general point of view. And that's where I think I have a lot of room to grow in okay. terms of making my stuff more expressive and enable that more people understand. I will still use big words because sometimes they are the right words. Mm -hmm. But at some points, you have to make sure you are coherent or mm -hmm. that you are presenting something that makes sense. I have no problem using more technical vocabulary, but I will follow up with a line of this is what it means after that. Wow. I think there's space for both. I also think that a lot of, I also think there's a lot of people who use jargon as a barrier to entry. I don't believe in that at all. For a long time, I used to feel like I was doing that, but it was unconscious on my part. That's just the way I talk, as you can tell. <laughs> it's just very, like, I might not want to, I might want to be more clear, but sometimes I'm going to default to the more complicated expression because that's where my brain goes. Or my brain immediately thinks of this is what it is, and this is the best way to describe it as it is. Um, I think when it comes to translating ideas, I think I don't claim to be as much of an educator. And I think that can be both a blessing and a curse. Mm -hmm. As a critic, it allows me to state things more equivocally. Like, this is my opinion. This is what I think works in this space. And here's the commentary as of what. Um, if you want to catch up with me, there's my archive. Have fun. <laughs> but, mm -hmm. but that can be extremely dangerous. That can be the sort of thing where you're setting... You're setting yourself up to fail if people do not want to do the work. And a lot of people don't. If you have a talent and you have an industry built to reinforce how good you are at something and ergo, you should be paid for it. Ergo, you are put, you're being put on a pedestal. It, it can reinforce the sensitivity, it can reinforce ego. It also reinforces the fact that a lot of it, labels do a really bad job at, co at coaching artists these days and how to handle it. Right. Artist development's pretty much gone. And the other thing that I often bring up is that, like, and this is a quote from a rapper, is that if you're a musician, you're in the service industry. Like you are, you are providing a service. And a lot of people lose track of what that is. A lot of people lose track of what the value of performance is, what the value of what you are, being aware of the relationship you are forging with the audience which can be just as important. I had to teach myself. Yeah. Dear God, it's hard. Like it's, the thing is, is like, I remember, I'll give you an example of where this has bit me in the ass. Okay. Um, I had, I recently got my mic set up over there and the comment I got, and it was a good mic setup. I got it all configured properly. I got someone who comments on my videos like, have you ever considered running a DSing over your entire video? I'm like, oh shit, I don't know what this is. So four hours later, I had researched DSing. I had understand how to do it. I tried to find a way to automate it because God knows I'm not going line by line through every time I use an S sound that's a little bit too syllabant. I had to understand what syllabance was from there. And then it's just, it's compounding all of these things. It's just building on knowledge. And 
production for me has always been, I'm not an audio engineer. I'm, I, I don't have the tech, like you give me a software, you give me a week, I'll figure out how to use it because I'm good with computers. But at the same time, like I'm not a professional in that space. And sometimes like I can, which is why I will defer to colleagues or try to talk to other people. I'm like, does this sound off? Or can you describe why it might be off? I also think the other thing with YouTube is that for as much as accountable you are to your audience, you have to be accountable to yourself. You have to be because I've, I've seen too many creators burned out. I myself have burned out. I want to say twice, um, once at the end of 2018, once at the end of 2021, um, where I just had to, I had to step back. I had to decompress. I had to do less. And the struggle, I also think this is one struggle that often doesn't not go accounted for. You can't hear everything. You can't. Right. Like I cover on average between 200 and 350 albums in a year. Somewhere in that range. <laughs> the vast majority of people will hear five on average. I like, I've talked to people, like a lot of people do not like it when you tell them you on the average person listens to five, maybe five albums a year. A lot of people do not like hearing it. Because I'm like, of course, we listen to more. And I'm like, sure you do. <laughs> I'm like, and or, or the follow-up will be I'm like, sure, you heard more than that. Can you explain them? Can you articulate what you liked about them? Can you understand what they're going to do? Can you understand why they work the way they do? Why they're popular and something else isn't? That's a larger conversation that a lot of people are not great at having. <laughs> and that's the thing. This is all ultimately, in my opinion, it's a communications exercise. Right. Like if you are not clear in your communication and you're, if you're not clear in your communication, you're screwed out of the gate because people will pick apart the places where you're not, where you're not clear or you're inconsistent or contradictory. And on some level, it, even if you are clear, it won't matter. A lot of people who are coming to music critics are just simply looking to be validated. It's hard. I it's mean, the sort of thing true. where you know, like, it is, I, now for me, I'm the sort of person where I'm like, I, I don't, I would get sick of being disingenuous. So I would, I would burn out even faster. Um, and I enjoy good conversations. <laughs> sometimes I will, sometimes I will engage not to be provocative, but simply because I know my opinions will run against the grain just because they're my opinions. <laughs> right. But the other factor of this, and this is something that you got to be prepared for that backlash. I think that there's a lot of people, a lot of people want to be liked and they're not used to having the hard, they're not used to having to go deeper and they're not used to actually having the things they like get questioned. Um, because, and this is something I'm gonna quote from a video game critic that I've been watching for years. His name's Yahtzee Croshaw. Um, he does the series Zero Punctuation. Um, this is very, very early on. And he did, a, he did a response video to every, he ripped on one of the Super Smash Brothers games very, very early on. I wanna say 2008. Um, <laughs> and in his video, he got, he got so much negative feedback he took it in and he responded in a very profane manner. And he, his comment is like, he's like, why are you so insecure about what I have to say? Is it because that deep down you're feeling something that's niggling in the back of your mind that maybe I have a point and maybe you can't put it on a pedestal in the same way. And maybe you don't want to acknowledge that to yourself or your peers. It's, a, it's that question of that lingering insecurity that I think can really agitate a lot of people because people want to be sure of something and critics are often adding that that doubt or that complexifier it rapidly also comes down to the point that there's you as a critic you have to be willing to understand that there's some discourse that is not worth your time there's discourse that's worth having because you might be able to convince somebody or bring someone on board there's also discourse that just wants to waste your time and then there's the people who just want you to shut up and they will have you do it by any means necessary. And I'm one of the lucky ones. I am the, I'm someone who can present in a way that conveys authority and doesn't open myself up to a lot of immediate insults. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of my colleagues who are women in the space have it way worse. Mm -hmm. It's bad. It's really, really bad. Oh, there are so many stories. Um, <laughs> Kelsey Ballerini's left comments on my videos before. 
or whoever is running her branding, right. which I think I think it was her initially because she's always had more of a you. Uh, she's been better on the YouTube specter very early on because I got her first con back in 2015 when she was just starting out. I know some artists who are very active in certain spaces. Um, Eric Church is notorious for showing up in country blog comments and just being amazingly inflammatory. <laughs> He's got that reputation. Sturgill Simpson has it too. Um, hip hop artist. Um, there are some who have been extremely grateful. Like there have been some who have reached out to me and said, thank you for put, thank you for reviewing my stuff. Thank you for putting me on. Um, there was one artist, um, his name is Red Veil. Um, he sent me an Instagram DM. He's like, he sent me his album to get reviews. Like I've been watching your stuff since 2014. I like when it's, since I was like a kid, like a preteen teenager, I've got an album. Do you want to review it? He's now on tour with Danny Brown and JPEG Mafia. I'm going to go see him live in two days. And sometimes you'll get odd situations. Like sometimes you'll go to a live show and since I'm six foot five and I get recognized pretty quickly, like I'll have an artist who come up to me afterwards. He's like, so didn't like the mix on that last album, eh? And I'm like, yeah, that was a little bit too much reverb on it. Although sometimes you also encounter the cases where it's a little nastier, where you say a black metal act is not particularly good and then they try to punch you in the face at a show, um, which, which has happened. Um, and then there was the case where um, I'm not sure I'd safe to go to Houston, at least for me, because Scarface um, cussed me out in the, on Twitter at one point. Um, and I'm like, listen, like uh, I liked your album. I just didn't think it was transcendent. I think you've done better. And that our interaction was fine and dandy. And then some of my fans hopped into the replies and then everyone got blocked. And I'm like, fuck, I can go to Houston now. And I know for a fact, there are industry executives who have seen me and who have seen my videos and who have blocked me on principle. Mm -hmm. Nashville has got a bunch of them because um, I'm not particularly kind to them. Um, I know there are artists who have watched my stuff and reacted to my stuff. That recent one was Jake Owen. I put out a mm -hmm. review of his album. And he's followed me for years and he just, and then he actually shot a video on a golf course when he was responding to my video <laughs> review of it, which was be fiercely critical, be analytical, um, don't take shit, which is, which can be a tough thing to sell to some people. And sometimes it's just, it's, I also think there's an element of conducting yourself well. I mm -hmm. think that is something that I think is, especially as a YouTuber can often go overlooked in terms of like, I don't engage with drama i don't engage i don't go at people and there's sometimes i wish i could like sometimes actually sometimes i really know i could but at the other times i'm like i'm taking a higher road this is not what i'm here to do i'm not here just to churn out content i'm here to make analysis i'm not here to stir up drama i'm here to get to a, a better point the comment i make with reaction videos is that there's a difference between the person who is just there for the reaction versus those who are there for the reactor Mm -hmm. Like the people who can actually build a following based off of their analysis or based off of the unique charisma they will bring to a scene. There's a couple of them. I actually think who do a really good job in reaction content. I think it's also an, an oversaturated field to the point where the standard album review, what I do is actually undersaturated now. There's very few people who do it beyond me and Fantano, a couple other smaller creators who just do not get the traction they should. Here's the thing. Like you have to be able to roll with the punches. Every business is going to have ups and downs. I treat this like a business. So my biggest initial regret was in 20, end of 2018, I was burned out, like hardcore burned out. I covered like 350 albums that year. It had been a hard year for me personally and physically and I actually broke my elbow in a bike accident. <laughs> like I had changed jobs that year, bad situation with that. Um, and I just like, I need to slow down. And I previously had my Patreon set up as predominantly per video. I switched it to per month because I'm like, I need to have freedom to do my own thing. Right. Big mistake. Um, hmm. I saw my revenue drop by two thirds. And for as much space as I gave myself, it wasn't addressing the root causes of my issues. So I ultimately changed it back to per, I changed it back a year later. The problem is Patreon does not allow you to go back and reassign people to the proper tiers. And most people just contribute to Patreon and walk away. There's other small regrets. Um, I wish that certain videos had come out better. I wish that I had been, there's some presentation I feel like there's not my best. I am um, one of my biggest reviews. I'm not exactly proud of. It's my review of AJR's The Click. I think that album is one of the worst of the 2010s. It, it is. 
Um, it, it, it's atrocious, but mm -hmm. I also came across, I, I, it's, there was a period online between 2007 to really today where the angry review, like the one that's full of a bunch of expletives and swearing, that's the one that gets the most traction. That was one of those videos. And I filmed it when I was sick. I filmed it when I was in a horrible mood. I, I did, I gave the album a fair shake, but honestly, it's, I, I look like shit in the video. And that's the one that happens to get nearly a hundred thousand hits. Like, again, you cannot control what goes viral. And it was, it was frustrating. Um, I think for me, I wish I take more, I wish I would just more willing to take more chances or be willing to cut bait faster. Like for me, the shorts were doing well for a while. And then I'm like, ah, like I wasn't making that, they weren't going viral. Like I wasn't catching a lot of traction from them. And I liked having longer, being slightly longer form content, maybe not super long, but mm -hmm. requires a ton of editing because I'm trying to always improve my process. Beyond that, anything else I might be able to do to improve my presentation, I'm all ears. I wish I understood TikTok. And for me, it's the sort of thing, I wish I understood how their algorithm worked or how to like how to build a following there i mm -hmm. feel you need to be looser than i am for that mm -hmm. i am i you have i'm recognizing that i am more familiar with traditional i would fit better in a traditional media environment like i can see again if i, I built a show that i could pitch to tv i also think being able to recognize your stark limitations is something that YouTube will make you very fundamentally aware of very fast. But at the same time, it's also being able to differentiate between the haters and the people who are just there to make your life miserable and legit critique can be hard and you're always late to it. To quote that rapper that I mentioned another time, you are always, as a performer, as someone in a space like this, you are always the last to know. You're the last to know when you're hot. You're the last to know when you're cold. Yeah. The thing is, and this is the little secret that I think a lot of people don't know, it basically, you train your own audience. If you're used to putting out content maybe once a week, they'll come back once a week. If you're used to content once a month, they'll come back once a month. If you're used to putting out content once every six to eight months, and you're putting out a three-hour piece of content at that point, they'll come back for that. I, I, a lot of this, I think, a lot of people do not make the effort to understand, they don't make the effort to understand their audience. And I think for some people, when you get to a certain size, that becomes impossible because your audience is just so friggin' huge and mm -hmm. often comes up so fast without any PR training, mm -hmm. without any training how to assess what this audience is and what they say about you. So you build up obligate. So the questions about obligations to the audience, for me, a lot of it has basically become like, I have to be willing to push back against my audience. Otherwise, it, otherwise, I built my own echo chamber. And that gets real boring really fast. <laughs> I like to get about three to four reviews out a week because that's normally the pace in which I operate. I'm mm -hmm. giving myself more breathing room as of this year. I went mm -hmm. to Barbados for a week. I didn't upload. It was good for me. But I'm also not the sort of person who relaxes easily. I'm the sort of person who's thinking about the next project, who is scripting stuff. I have so many unfinished scripts. <laughs> I might want to write another book at some point. I'm going to need to take time to do that. Mm -hmm. So you get people accustomed to a schedule. If you get people accustomed to a schedule, they will be just fine with it. The other key thing, though, is that it's not always based on uploads. It's based on watch time. So oftentimes YouTube rewards longer videos mm -hmm. and engagement in those longer videos. That's the tricky thing. If people just watch the first five seconds and click off, nope, no, no, you got to stick around. Well, billboard breakdown is easy. That's in its own silo. It gets done. Um, I have I have an idea of what albums are dropping every week. And I have that planned out for the next three to four months. Um, so I know roughly what that's going to look like. Some albums are incredibly easy to review. I hear them three to four times. Okay, it's done. It's like that. Sometimes you plan for a longer form for both something that's really good, something that's really bad, or something that you know it's going to draw a lot of traffic. I'm thinking Drake probably drops in two days. That's my guess, because everyone seems to be getting out of the way. Besides that piece, um, I've got long-form content that gets done when it gets done. I've, I, I will set deadlines for myself internally. I'm like, okay, you just got to sit down, script this thing, get it out of the way. But sometimes it's just like, no. Sometimes you have to, as a writer, things come as they come. Or sometimes you get, for me, I often realize I write in spurts. Like 
I will have points where I will write and it comes out really, really fast because I've already pre-written half of it in my head. Sometimes it's agony to get stuff out. The one thing which I have hard set deadlines for, mid-year list, year-end list. They gotta be done by the by either June 30th or the end of the year. You're getting them done, you're getting them done. And those are half hour, like mid-year list of half hour content, the list of the best and worst hits, that's half hour content. The list of the best and the best songs, the best albums, that's an hour each. The I think the lists are the best way to get people on board because you present a larger overarching narrative, or you try to, mostly you fail to, and, and then you try to make the conversation interesting in the failure. Because a lot of music critics, myself included, love to try to wrap everything up into a larger narrative about what, what's going on. This is what music is like, like chronicle music. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I've also realized you can't. Like you can't for everybody. You will not hear everything. It's not physically possible. Um, so you try to structure as much of this is what it was for me in this space. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it gets a, like my, everyone always says the worst video, the worst hits videos do the best. That's true because the internet just strong negativity, but I always like to go to the best hits best most quickly. Okay. <laughs> my favorite two videos that I've done uh, beyond my video essays, which I'm really proud of, um, but I don't think they're an easy jump on point. I think my video essays are pretty dense. You kind of have to know what you're getting when you're getting into those because mm -hmm. they're like an hour long and they've got a lot of, a lot of shit happening. Um, but the video I like to point to is my best hit songs of the 2010s and mm -hmm. the best and my top 100 best albums of the 2010s. The top 100 best albums is a three hour video. <laughs> long, but it gives you the context of where I am. <laughs> you have people who are really drawn to the short form or people who are like, you know, I'm just going to put this four hour video on in the background. Tough to say. I think some people like the level of writing that I bring to it, like in terms of the creativity of that. I think people like that I show them stuff that they've never heard before. I've actually been told that a lot. I, like you're showing me stuff that I've never heard. If I'm only getting really creative, um, like video essays are all their own thing because they come with like, outfit changes changing of the lights and like you're doing there's a lot there's more production design stuff that goes into those yeah, uh, album bomb means that when there are multiple songs from one project that drops in the tracking week that will all hit on the chart in the same week album bomb album bomb but album bomb them, them having their own presence on the charts because the album chart the the billboard 200 is where the album sales are, tra are tracked um, the Hot 100, it's the singles chart, or it, it's more of a songs chart these days. Um, with the advent of streaming, um, it's led for, if some people are listening to entire albums, multiple songs on that album will all chart at once. Yeah. Sometimes that will give you an idea of, oh, because of this guest performer, this is now debuting based on that attention. Or based on, normally it's the first five or six songs on the album. <laughs> there is examples of this happening pre-streaming. Taylor Swift is a big one. One Direction was a big one. Um, Drake sometimes was. He really came in his own in the album bomb, mostly because his albums were so friggin' long. Um, um, a lot of it was very much, if you are streaming dominance, you will normally have an album bomb on the charts because that's how music is rewarded these days in terms of what tracks. A lot of these songs are not guaranteed to become hits, but a lot of labels pay attention to what what comes from an album bomb and what lasts. Mm. If something hits the chart one week and is gone the next week, we're not throwing more money behind it. But if something lasts, it lasts maybe two, three, four weeks. I'm like, okay, this could be a single or it could be a fan favorite. And sometimes that's already buoyed. Sometimes the label already has the market research in place. Like, okay, we know this tested well, all of the money now to support it. But sometimes it's like, oh shit, we didn't expect that would work, but why not give it a shot? The one thing I will say with this is that it's is that specific artists album bomb in different ways. Taylor Swift is a fascinating one because she she routinely has gotten them since I want to say reputation. No, since 1989. 1989, she will get the album bomb or the entire or nearly the entire album charts. Mm -hmm. But she's also what came up in an environment that was very singles driven. Like these are the songs that get shipped to pop radio at this time at this venture. And watching a lot of radio acts adjust to streaming has been fascinating. If you want a case study of how that's happened, 2018, Cardi B versus Nicki Minaj. 
Nicki Minaj was trying to album bomb the charts and she kind of did, but nowhere near as well she should have. Whereas mm-hmm. Cardi kind of just ran roughshod, entire album, hit the charts, multiple songs stuck around multiple weeks and translated into real tangible singles runs. Sure. Which is entirely why I'm not surprised Atlantic is so pa- is so panicked at the fact that, oh crap, we might not be able to do this twice. <laughs> it's important to highlight that rap is about 50 years old now. It's not new. There's a pedigree of rap that has existed for decades now. There's a song by one of my favorite rappers. It's called Rappers Will Die of Natural Causes. Four. Lying on the edge of a cliff. Watching everything fall down. And it's, it, it talks about the fact that rappers will become middle-aged. Rappers will start dying, not because they get shot or because of gang violence, but because, no, they will, they'll wait for their children to call them and they'll die in nursing homes. Right. It's actually a really bleak song. It's by an artist called Open Mike Eagle. His catalog's fantastic. The comment that I always have with rap is that, and this is where I feel a lot of classical, classically trained teachers struggle with rap, is they don't understand the types of musicality that goes into it. Rap is often very heavily rooted in old samples of disco, old samples of reggae, old samples of jazz, especially in the modern era. Um, So if you understand the musicality of those samples, a lot of that will play into how you can address how these songs flow. Um, The next, I will say it's gotten even more pronounced with certain artists like Most Def, Fonte, the massive wave of trap artists who came up in that wake where melody is so much more prominent. A lot of classically, a lot of classically trained people really balked at rap in the 80s and 90s because it was so beat driven. And it was so very, it was very hard hitting. It was very, it didn't, it didn't have the flow that they were used to. Now I would push back and say, okay, but depending on the classical movements, there are, there are slots that was also very beat driven, drew upon jazz, also had complexities that you got to be able to roll with some of that as time passes. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's not like, and I've listened to enough bad prog metal that's just wank on, it was just classical wank in a different setting. Like I've heard that crap. Um, My thinking with that is that if you look, if anything, I think rap as it is right now is most able to be accessible to a wider audience because it is more tuneful. And so you have that melody, you have that complexity, especially with trap, given that a lot of it relies on eighth notes and how, in terms of how the drum patterns go, there's actually a level of complexity that I think is often not sought out to the same degree. It seems like everyone's doing it. And I'm like, yeah, but there's a way of doing it well. Um, I will also say in terms of content, there's a lot of rappers who, are, who have now become parents and who have realized okay, there's stuff that we can show our kids, but there's stuff that maybe isn't appropriate. And the, and a lot of rappers have put in the work to try to find stuff or try to make stuff that is more pop friendly and accessible. And let's be fair, that's been around since the very beginning. MC <laughs> Hammer was a thing. Will Smith <laughs> was a thing. Pop rap has been around forever. There is more risque subject matter, but that's true in every genre. We don't we don't criticize rock in the same elements for all the crap that Led Zeppelin got away with, where well, they weren't well, stealing from the Yardbirds. Um, like all these genres have their have their risque side, have their elements that have often been sanitized or whitewashed or shoved out of history. Even classical music has some of it too, yep. which is fascinating. And you go back and read what some of those composers were into. <laughs> like but now, granted, the I often think a lot of it comes with that comes with a very you got to be careful with rap with with some people crack down on rap because it often just comes reveals a racial bias which can be like oh it's it's the it's the hip-hop and it's the same fight that got pushed against rock and roll back in the 50s and like okay we know what you're doing (laughs) here's the thing i often think that a lot of that conversation is easier for kids then we give them credit a lot of adults are terrified to engage because they're or they're afraid of getting something wrong where in reality, if you're in community with people, of course you're going to get shit wrong. It's a factor of being human. The factor is learning and rolling with it, trying to find mm-hmm. things to do better. Like there's ways that we can make this better. There's not, you don't have to ossify and just be set in your ways. If you're willing to learn and you're willing to listen, it'll get better. But again, that gets back to the points about education that you raised earlier. It's the point of, are you there to learn? Or are you there to work? Are you there to like go and get your job? I say music, movies, art, and culture as my tagline that mm-hmm. gives me flexibility because I've like, I did a review of the Barbie movie. Like there's a lot of music in that movie, but even beyond that, like 
I enjoy, I'm not as heavily versed in film. I've also rapidly discovered that film discourse is so much worse than music discourse. My God. A lot of the philosophy which I approached the Barbie movie and I managed to pull out of that, I'm like, this is stuff that, this is conversations I've been having in music spaces for years now. Mm -hmm. And to see that film spaces are so slow to it and have not, and aren't willing to engage on that level, I thought was very telling. But again, it's also a, it's a highlight of how culture can get so siloed. Okay. I keep my tagline open predominantly because mu music, movies, art, and culture, I think art and culture is intrinsic to all of this. And that's my, that, that's the overarching thing that lets me get away with tangents into philosophy or sports or politics. Mm -hmm. I also think that politics, I could say music, movie, art, politics, and culture. If I put politics in there, I would piss so many people off, even though I'm, even though in all due fairness, probably belongs there. Oh, if you're in the situation where you can avoid politics in the conversation of culture, you don't realize how political that is. I, I'm meticulous. I have to be. People are who call me super negative piss me off because I'm like, I put out lists that are hours long of all the, the stuff thing. I love from a given year. Right. And just because you don't make the, just because not you specifically, but you in general, like a lot of people do not go and seek stuff out. They, they don't want to put in the work, especially, which is why I'm trying to draw an audience that will. So I often feel very contentious about the whole idea that I'm a caustic critic or I'm someone who's super negative all the time. And I'm like, no, I'm not. Mm -hmm. I'm negative because you found an opinion of mine that you don't like, or it, it impugns something that you like. You didn't go looking for the video where I was more positive on something that you thought sucked. And I've right. got a bunch of those too. <laughs> like my big one was I really liked Machine Gun Kelly's 2020 album. And finally, from Machine Gun Kelly, tickets to my down. And that was not that was not popular at mm -hmm. all. Like it was me and Todd in the Shadows of the as the two people who actually kind of endorsed that. Fantano mm -hmm. hated it. And when you're creating, when a lot of critics of size are very much saying this sucks, it creates a pile-on effect. Right. Whereas I'm like. You know what? I actually really like this. I think it's great music. It has Halsey's best performance maybe ever on it. Like, <laughs> like there's a lot of phenomenal grooves on it. Travis Barker, best ever production outside of Blink-182. I'm like, there's so much good about this, but so many people who are not willing to validate it because it's Machine Gun Kelly and he's considered a joke since he went at Eminem. Um, so I'm like, I feel like the there's a bigger conversation about empathy there. Right. And who we are willing to extend empathy to in critic and in being and in being a critic. That's where I think I am trying to do more, mm -hmm. and that's where I think I I can improve the most is being willing to share more empathy with the people I'm trying to talk to. Like initially, as a critic, I was pretty harsh. I was pretty mean at spots, and I, I was I didn't you don't diss the audience, you don't diss the artist, and you never diss the artist audience. That's the mm -hmm. biggest mistake you can ever make as a critic, in my opinion. But if you try to actually extend empathy, you try to actually, you will find things to like in places you never expected. Music is, off, is, is all subjective in how we react to music. A lot of people want to use it as objective. I did an entire hour long video essay why that's bullshit. We do, we do not want to, it's tied to the conversation of we do not want to separate art from artist. Mm -hmm. We don't want to talk about having that conversation. It wasn't that we can't do it. I think oftentimes we do it more often than we, we do it when it's artists we like. And I think that the conversation about what that means, the conversation of what we put into art, it can often be very personal. It can often be very charged. So when someone is critical of it or does not see in alignment with you, you can take it very personally. Mm -hmm. Especially, in my opinion, when you have acts where the appeal is less the technical competency and, and more the fact that it is going to sound a little contentious, the fact when it it reinforces something that resonates deeply with you, that you could maybe do it too. The one example I always point to is XXX Tentacion, rest in peace, um, because a lot of his music was not technically sound at all. Like it, it was mastered like crap. It was mixed like crap. The lyrics were amateurish. They were very simplistic structures, but he had a following a big big following to this day and i always looked at that and i'm like okay why are so many guys drawn to this and i'm like okay it's 
part of this is like, it's a feel that they can do it too. It's a feel that we are, there's that level of relatability and you get, and there's a lot of people get really defensive about that because they are drawn to that. So while I, I think his albums are garbage, but at the same time, it's also like, yeah, I get why someone would be drawn to that. It's trying to find, it's trying to find not just as a critic, you gotta be willing to understand what doesn't work for you and why it works for someone else. Right. And vice versa. I don't think enough critics are introspective enough. Mm. I think there's a lot of beyond the necessary amount of therapy that every critic should go to on a regular basis, given some of the stuff we are having to be exposed to. And, mm. but I also think there's an element of you have to be willing to drill deeper into mm. why you like this. Mm. It's not like what makes this special? Why does this resonate with you? And why, and why, or maybe why not? Mm-hmm. why isn't something right. clicking and mm-hmm. then be willing to admit when it doesn't some and again like sometimes again we we cannot figure out the human mind we're not all going to react the same to the same artistic stimuli that's what makes it interesting yeah. that's one reason i kind of really hate the culture of ranking and scores and why i got rid of them a lot of people really cottoned on to it because they're like oh he gave that an eight that means he must like it's above all these acts that are given a seven and i'm like you're missing the conversation you're missing the stuff that's more deep and interesting. I'm going to use, I will use scores in my own personal logs for how I thought about something at a time and then changed it. Mm. But at the same time, like, I think there's a lot of people who will go to a score over any sort of discourse. It drives me nuts. And I also think that since a lot of music critics or music fans are into very experimental stuff, you also create this barrier where you have a lot of these albums that are rated really, really highly but are really, really tough to get into. Mm. Like I will, I don't recommend anyone check out Swans if they are not ready for what's coming. Swans, to give you some context, they've been around since the 80s. They are a no-wave drone act. Their albums normally run two hours plus. Okay. And they build these very long cyclical progressions with incredibly visceral and graphic lyrics. They are not for everybody. Right. But they are some of the most highly acclaimed acts you will ever see among most music critics. Huh. I get why. I liked their out. Al- I liked Swans' album this year a lot. But I also get why for someone who's like, oh, this cool band is getting a lot of attention. This got a lot of critical acclaim. I should check it out. Oh my god, this is terrifying. <laughs> like you see that reaction, and you right. say, and then some people feel like, oh, I'm stupid because I don't like this experimental music. I'm like, no, you might not like. It might not. You might bounce off of it. Experimental music's like that. <laughs> But until then, I'm Mark, you're watching Billboard Breakdown, affiliated with Spectrum Pulse. And I'll see you next time. Okay, we're done.